our ladies who are pregnant come with a variety of issues, right? So um, we've got pre-existing medical conditions. You've got issues that you could have with the pregnancy. There could be issues with the fetus itself. And again, our physical assessment techniques are going to help us figure out how to best manage for this, this population. So our goals, you know, physical assessment is a big part of it. You know, nice thorough assessment. Form a differential diagnosis and treatment plan and then anticipate any complications to provide the best care possible. So a couple of key numbers for pregnant ladies. Gestation is averages about 266 days for a human female. Feels like a long time when you're in their 250th day. So by definition, premature infants are less than 37 weeks and then your overdue or your post-mature infants have been in for 42 weeks or longer. And we know they're divided into trimesters. So on physical assessment, you've probably seen this diagram before, you're looking for that fundus. Has anyone ever had the opportunity to palpate a fundus? Yes, <laughs> a couple, I see a couple nods. Um, so for those of you who don't, you know, as you're palpating the belly, you're starting above the symphysis pubis, working your way up, and you're looking kind of for that top of that uterus. And the, the picture shows us that based on how high or how many, I believe it's in centimeters, where you're located, you can estimate the weeks that the woman is based on where that fundal height is. So at, at 20 weeks, it should be about at the umbilicus. And then as they get past 20 weeks, again, it's going to proceed above the umbilicus. In emergent situations where the females have complaints, something's not going quite right, we are not asked to do any type of exam that involves putting anything into the vaginal vault. But we certainly do want to do perineal visualization so that we're looking for things, right? Looking for a, a stray foot, looking for a cord, looking for bloody show, looking for hemorrhage. So again, we're going to inspect that perineum. General rule of thumb, vitals every 15 minutes unless the medical condition indicates uh, quicker or more often. Fetal heart tones, what do you guys use to, do you measure fetal heart tones? Pregnant lady? Anybody in the room trained to do fetal heart tone? No? Fairly simple technique, but you do need a little, you know, in the ER we have the little Doppler, the little handheld Doppler, and we'll use that. The diagram just kind of shows one of the common locations that you were usually going side to side in the lower abdomen looking for fetal heart tones. The key is to feel mom's pulse at the same time that you're listening so that you can differentiate between her heart rate and the fetal heart rate. But we're looking at a rate of between 110 and 160 to be expected, to be normal. Now does anyone have any other kind of fetal monitoring capability in their rigs? Any of the belts that do monitoring? Okay, good, because that's fine. I don't need to go into the science of that. All right, if we have a, fetal, a fetus that's in distress, so the fetal heart tones would be too low. Again, we have to provide some emergent care to try and oxygenate that infant as best as possible. So we're going to give 100% oxygen to, pre to preserve mom's blood flow or get that blood return to her heart so that she can pump it to the baby. What's the best position for mom to be in? It's up there. Yeah, left lateral recumbent. What are we taking pressure off of when we put mom on her left side? Inferior vena cava, awesome. So that way blood flow can get back into circulation. If mom is hypotensive, we're gonna give repeat fluid boluses, again, to bring that pressure up. We're gonna do external view, but no internal view. Um, and do you guys transport babe or moms on oxytocin? Yeah, so you will have to, oxy drips going, okay. Um, so if the, now if you have oxytocin on board while they're being transported, do they have fetal monitoring on at the same time? No, so you've got, all right, so there's some physical assessment challenges there related to that. Because if that fetus in the hospital <coughs> environment, while they've got the big belt and the monitor on, if the fetus's heart rate drops during an oxytocin infusion, they may have to DC it because the contraction might be too strong that it's actually causing the babe not to get enough blood circulation. All right, so let's take a look at two conditions that may cause mom, pregnant mom, to call 911. 
So we have the abruptio placentae and then the placenta previa. So definition of abruptio, the first one on the left. If you see where the number one is, can you see the hemorrhage that's happening there underneath the placenta? So something has happened that has caused the placenta to come away from the uterine wall. And we now have hemorrhage going on underneath. Can it be minor? Can it be major? Absolutely. So it just depends on how much of that placenta has separated. With the placenta previa, that's more the position. It's where the placenta has locked into the inside of that uterus. And placenta previa can completely cover the cervical os, like you see in this picture, or it can be a partial covering. Now, symptoms that mom might experience for each of these are quite different. So let's take a look at how we would differentiate those. For the abrupt show, so this is where we've got the separation from the placenta to the uterine wall. Most women, or, or half, of, half of women, will have some kind of abdominal pain, where the other one, the previa, is painless. More than 90% of them will have uterine contractions triggered by the separation of the placenta, and 90% of them will have vaginal bleeding unless it's all concealed underneath the placenta where it's been, where it's hemorrhaging. And they may have fetal demise, so we might, mom might not be feeling any movement anymore, and fetal heart tones would be not present. Really severe cases, so we've got a lot of hemorrhaging going on inside that uterus. When you feel that uterus, it's going to be rigid. So instead of soft, feeling like a, a fluid-filled balloon with the baby inside, now you've got this rigid, hard ball, like a bowling ball. And mom will present with signs and symptoms of hemorrhagic shock. So what would you expect to see in her vitals? Tachycardia, low blood pressure, exactly. So we'd want to address those. All right, so management. Let's get her on some oxygen. Again, get as much oxygen to that fetus as we can. If she has airway issues, we're going to address those. You know, assist ventilations, intubate if necessary. She needs two large bore IVs because we're going to start with what kind of fluids? Yeah, we're going to start with isotonic crystalloids, and then usually after how many liters do we like to switch over if we need to do blood replacement? Yeah, usually about two liters, then we're looking at blood if, if, if it's available. Um, Foley catheter. <laughs> If, if available, you know, if, she, if she's a hospital-to-hospital -hospital transport and we've got the Foley catheter in place, the goal for our urine output would be what? How many cc's per hour? 30 is your minimum. can be a weight-based weight -based goal as well, so looking for a half, um, half cc to one cc per kilogram. These pictures show the different previous. So you can see, you have a little bit of impingement all the way to complete impingement. These moms will have bleeding, but it's painless. Bright red bleeding. Their abdominal exam is usually benign, but again, we don't want to put anything in there, because if we introduce anything into the vaginal vault, we may cause further rupturing or tearing of that placenta. For previa, this is, this is the diagnostic path. So remember when you're dealing with one of these charts, look at the, look at the top. So we're going, we're going through the diagnostic process. And at the bottom, we see our end goal might be, or our end product might be cesarean birth. So why does that happen? <clears throat> if the baby is more than 37 weeks, so they'd be considered full term, bleeding continues or they have complete previa, that baby's obviously not going to be able to pass through the vaginal vault, so we need to get them out through C-section. If they have bleeding stopped or minimal and no fetal distress, um, the larger box there talks about induction of labor if it's a low line or marginal, but if it's a complete presentation, then they we're going to anticipate the C-section. So they'll do a little more ultrasound to figure out exactly where that, that um, placenta is located. For less than 37 weeks, of course our goal is to keep that baby in if we can, um, but it might not be possible. If bleeding reoccurs, labor is present. Again, they're going to go right for the C-section. If the bleeding is well controlled and there's no contractions, they're looking at that list over there, bed rest, vital signs, um, every four hours, IV fluids, type and cross match, just in case they start to hemorrhage with observation. 
So again, this is the diagnostic pathway that they'll follow once mom is at the hospital. <clears throat> All right, let's look at preterm labor. So might have, have you had calls from ladies? Think they need to go to the hospital because they're having contractions? <laughs> so how do you know if they're preterm or not? Where are some of the clues that you guys use? Yeah, what's the due date? Are they ready? <laughs> Wait, what did you? Yeah, yeah, so looking again at those assessment pieces. So preterm labor, by definition, are contractions that are occurring between the 20th and the 37th week of gestation. Um, maternal complications of premature labor. So if <coughs> uh, we could have the endometriitis, sepsis, septic shock. PROM stands for premature rupture of membranes, if you're not familiar. And chorioamnionitis, which would be infection in the amniotic fluid. Fetal consequences can be premature birth, because they're not supposed to come quite yet. And unfortunately, it accounts for about 100 de deaths of infants out of every 100,000 in the US annually. So our assessment, rupture of membranes. You mentioned that. Did, has, was it a small bloody show? Was there a lot of bleeding with it? Um, once they get to the hospital and an appropriate provider can do that vaginal exam, they'll look for membranes, look for dil dilatation of the cervix. If we see drainage coming out, do you have the ability to test drainage for pH? I know. <laughs> what do you want? That's a good question. We do have pH paper in the ER. It's located in our eye room because we do it for the eye test for the eye exposures. But if you needed to, and again, I worked at St. Luke's in those years when OB transitioned out of the building over to West Dallas. And from the ER perspective, that was really tough because we always had that resource to call and they could come down and deal with these OB emergencies if necessary. But now when the ladies would show up, it was all on the ER and t to do the full workup before we determined if they needed to be transferred to West Dallas or Sinai as an appropriate location. So if they would be leaking amniotic fluid, what could a little bit of that could be collected. You could chest test the pH, and on the nitrazine paper, it would show less than 6.5 as a measurement. Or there's the feather test. Um, a little bit of the amniotic fluid can be put on a glass slide. Again, have to get one of those from the lab. We don't have those in the department, but put a little bit on, and then as it dries, it has a real distinct feather pattern to it, and that's also a positive indication of amniotic fluid. A little, I, I've not actually seen that done in practice, but available as part of the assessment. We want to measure fundal height again. That'll kind of help us estimate when the due date is, fetal heart rates if possible, and if there's any contractions. So our goals for preterm labor. Again, perfuse that infant to the best of our ability. So hydrate mom if necessary. We're going to give 100% oxygen. And uh, volume replacement if we think dehydration. And then a lot of the books, you, some, the book that I was <laughs> reading uses the word tocolytic. Have you heard that term before? It was actually a new term to me as long as I've been doing this. So tocolytic means to stop or cease contractions. Magnesium sulfate, the most common. How does magnesium work to slow or stop contractions? What is it known for? It is a smooth muscle relaxer. So it's going to hopefully relax that uterus from having those preterm contractions. All right, imminent delivery. Uh-oh, you've arrived at the scene and that baby is coming. Get ready to catch. <laughs> Has anyone been part of an imminent delivery? A couple. Yeah, we had one delivered in a taxi cab outside the ER at St. Luke's on a ship that I was working. So one of my coworkers caught the baby. Um, and then another one delivered. They were coming in. If you're familiar with the St. Luke's campus at all, you know there's multiple entrances. She was coming in like the complete opposite side of the hospital from the ER. So she delivered right in the north building entrance, right inside the two glass doors. So yes, those precipitous births do happen. Did either of yours have any complications at all, or did they just they just squirt it out? This one had a breach. A breach presentation. Yeah. So some synonyms to imminent delivery. So that baby that is going to come no matter what, you may hear the term emergency childbirth, precipitous delivery, or birth on arrival. You know, they get there and squirt it up. All right, so indications. You guys experienced that. She's having contractions. She says it's coming. It's a good indication. Um, when you look in the perineum, you see bulge or crown, or she may have that feeling like she has to defecate or bear down because her body's telling her like, 
what do you need to do? Stay calm. <laughs> and control. That's what we do well in our profession usually. And don't delay the delivery. It's going to happen. That baby is coming whether we want it to or not. So we want to do our best as the baby is being born to kind of control the expulsion without stopping it from coming out. We just don't want it to come all the way out without some kind of control. Because, of course, the baby who was born in a taxi cab outside of our ER at Luke's at the time um, slipped and went to the ground. So it landed on its head and its shoulder. It was okay, but again, gave the staff quite the fright. Reasonably so. So we want to, you know, not only do we want to catch the baby, but things that can happen to mom, you know, she can tear. You can have quite some pretty significant perineal tearing, lacerations, and damage to the urethra. So again, kind of controlled rate so that doesn't happen to the best of our ability. If mom is walking or in a chair and there's not time to place her on a stretcher, of course, we might need to go to the floor. We want to keep fingers out of the vagina so we're not introducing any type of bacteria. This is considered a clean procedure. It's not sterile. We do have a... The only thing that we, you know, the sterile pack that we have in the ED, do you guys have a delivery pack on the rigs that has the scissors? Those are all, those items are all sterile. But the actual like prepping of mom, she's not in a sterile field. You know, we're, we'll drape her, protect her modesty, put some kind of pad down. If we can, I mean, baby's coming. It's not always easy to get a full history on mom. There's a lot more questions that you can ask, but of course these are some key. You know, when's her due date? So we know if this baby's full term or not. Did she have any complications identified in the pregnancy? Should we expect more than one to pop out? Are there multiple births inside there? Rupture of membranes, did it happen? Does she remember when? What was the color of the amniotic fluid? Why is that important? Yeah, does she have meconium staining? Is that baby, can we anticipate any distress as a result of that? And did she have any vaginal bleeding prior to this? So be prepared to give firm, calm instructions. You guys are all excellent at that. Um, contractions that occur every one to two minutes and last about a minute to a minute and a half are indicative that she's probably ready to start pushing. And do remember that it's not a teaching moment. There's a little too much stress going on for mom right there. Um, so if she, you know, ask her if she took a breathing class, you know, do you know, you know, do you have any breathing exercises that you can implement right now, you know, put, the, put them into place or just teach her inhale through the mouth and exhale through pursed lips. For positioning, dorsal recumbent, so laying back is fine with knees bent. Um, left, line, left side line is also an option with knees bent. Get your equipment, absorbent pad, towels, whatever you have available. Um, drape underneath if you can. If you have time permitting, they usually do wash the perineum with some kind of antiseptic soap. So just kind of wash the area. Do you have anything on the rig that would suit that? All right, just get ready to catch them. <laughs> All right, so there's some pictures on the next few slides to just kind of show the process of the baby coming out. Infants usually can deliver themselves. You know, they follow a natural progression out of the vaginal vault and they will turn. It's when, they, it's when we run into some of the problems that you guys researched that we have to do more interventions. So if mom pants as the head is being delivered, that helps control the rate of the delivery, kind of helps slow it down. The picture here shows um, the assistant supporting the perineum, again, so the perineum doesn't have a tendency to bulge or rip. So we're holding those, that, that tissue to allow, we're not keeping the baby in, we're just controlling the rate of delivery. Again, you can see more support of the perineal area. Then we have the hand on the head as the baby starts to emerge to, again, help guide the baby out. We want to avoid that rapid expulsion and support the head. It's going to rotate naturally as it comes down. Once the head out, um, if you see, you were going to look at that head in the face, mom's membranes might be still intact. So the baby will come out kind of looking like they're in a balloon. What are we going to do? Take, yep, take, our, take some gauze finger. We're going to clean those membranes away from the baby's face uh, <coughs> to open that up. Then we want to check for umbilical cord. So you're going to feel down around the chin the neck area, looking for the umbilical cord. If we can address <coughs> it, procedures to attempt to slide it over the head to get it out of the way. 
as baby comes out, looking at suctioning the mouth first, nary second. Suctioning the nose usually causes the gasp, kind of stimulates the respiratory, so that's why we're going for the mouth first. And it also helps them prevent any of them from aspirating anything in the oropharynx. If we don't have a bulb syringe available, just a glove, gauze over a glove finger works as well. If we see meconium, we want to suction sooner than later because as soon as they start to take those first breaths, they might aspirate that content. I love this picture. It looks like they're pulling them out, doesn't it? Twisting that baby out. Again, they're just kind of help guiding them. Have you seen a physician deliver a baby? Yeah. Have you seen them kind of do that manipulation where they're working on it? <coughs> yeah, it's, I, don't, I have not done it myself, so I don't know what it feels like. But I've seen both a, a vaginal and a C-section birth. Um, quite interesting to participate in. All right, so once we've got the shoulders clear, infant's going to squirt out. So again, we want to support that body and catch it. Note the time of delivery. And then how do we manage the umbilical clamp? Where are we going to clamp it? A couple inches above. It's about three inches above the baby's abdomen. Second clamp, two to three inches away from that. Sterile scissors to cut between the two. If we don't have sterile equipment available, it is recommended not to cut the cord. But how would we position the baby with mom then? Yeah, so we're going to put, put baby on mom's, you kind of dry baby off, put him on mom's tummy. Um, at the level of mom or below, so we don't cause blood, abnormal blood flow. Do you guys measure APGARs? It was in the book. Okay, so we've got scoring at one minute, five minutes, and then if there are low scores, it should be an ongoing assessment for 20 total minutes. If we need to actively resuscitate our babe, um, the picture shows different ways of stimulating. So again, stimulating that foot, slapping that foot, um, rubbing the belly vigorously, rubbing the chest and belly. Again, we need to, so usually the drying process is enough to get ba to babe to wake. Um, and it also prevents heat, heat loss and stimulates. So this comes out of the uh, PALS, one of the PALS manuals. Just kind of shows most normal babies, normal births, babies don't require anything. Then less frequently you do have to do a little bit of positioning, clearing the airway. Um, sometimes they need ventilation, bag and mask. Some babies need chest compressions and even more rare is the administration of medications. So again, the majority of births are non-traumatic. Vital signs, so we want to know what to expect at birth. So we're looking for that heart rate again, should be the same as the fetal heart tones at this point. So we're looking in that 100 to 150, 160 range for that birth. If we have to open the airway, you know, baby's got those big heads, so we need a position appropriate. If we have meconium that's present, but the baby is vigorous, meaning that, you know, they're kind of fighting it and they've got some muscle tone, um, we're going to do suctioning what we can. And a vigorous baby has respiratory efforts. They have decent muscle tone and a heart rate over 100. So we're just going to look to clean things out and see if we can uh, protect them. If the baby's not vigorous, so showing signs of limp, poor respiratory effort, we're going to get some oxygen on board, intubate if possible, and suction trachea before ventilating. Because again, they probably have meconium in that airway, so we want to get it out of there. <coughs> If their heart rate is less than 60 after 30 seconds of ventilation, um, according to PALS, that's when we start compressions, right? I'm going to get on the chest. It's a 90 compressions, uh, 30 breaths per minute. Two thumb technique, so we practice that in our CPR. Once we have a heart rate over 60, we can stop chest compressions and spontaneous respirations. We'll continue to ventilate until that heart rate has improved to over 100, because that's our goal, target goal. If drugs are required, Epi, Narcan, you know, if the situation warrants it, mom might have those, that uh, narcotic on board. And then keep in mind glucose requirements, very high metabolism. So checking that blood sugar, being aware if infant needs excess 
supplementation of glucose. All right, so after birth, stick that baby on the breast. Stimulates the oxytocin, promotes contractions of the uterus. So now we're back to mom's body, making sure that we finish up this birthing process appropriately. The placenta comes out about 20 to 30 minutes after the baby is born. You can tell that it's about to come out when the cord starts to lengthen, because it's starting to move within that uterus, so the cord lengthens. We just don't want to tug on it. We want a little gentle traction to ease it out, but we don't want to pull it and cause any premature separation. Um, we don't want to put any pressure on the fundus at that time. Again, we just want to let it naturally birth itself. Um, placenta should be kept with mom until she is delivered to her destination. Oxytocin may be delivered if they need to firm up the uterus. Um, if it's firm, once it's firm, they'll decrease the drip. If it remains boggy, she has a risk for hemorrhage, so they may, may increase the oxytocin drip. This diagram just kind of showing how that uterus can be palpated. It should be about the size of a grapefruit. Um, that's our goal. Firmness is checked about every five minutes, looking for appropriateness. It is massaged if it's not firm to prevent hemorrhage. We want to monitor vital signs until stable. So usually five minutes every cup um, for the first period of time after birth. And massaging and feeling that uterus to see if it's returning to its, you know, returning to that grapefruit size that we expect. Because if we have that boggy uterus and we start to get a steady flow of blood, now we're concerned about the, you know, obviously concerned about this hemorrhage. So watching for signs of shock. Provide that high flow O2 if this is the case. Here we might use modified Trendelenburg. What does that mean? What is modified Trendelenburg? Head and, head and upper body supine, legs elevated. Um, in one of my emergency nursing resources, there was a little article, reference to an article about the dangers of Trendelenburg in and of itself when you have the patient with their head lower than the rest of their body. So baroreceptor stimulated, thinks the blood pressure is high, so you don't get the appropriate response. Can also increase intracranial pressure too, which may decrease your cerebral perfusion. So yes, Trendelenburg itself is not necessarily good. So modified is recommended here. Um, infant to the breast, because again, that can stimulate the uterus to firm up and slow the flow of the hemorrhage. Just like a trauma patient, she'll need those large bore, two large bore IVs. Um, if she has any la external lacerations, so if the perineum lacerated in any way and you have blood flowing from that, we need direct pressure. And then if we have protocols or, you know, oxytocin as prescribed, that may be initiated as well. For amniotic fluid embolism, I'm not taking care of a woman who's ever had this. Has anyone else experienced this? So again, I know some of these emergencies are, like, are, are, are kind of academic, but it's something we have to be aware of. Um, so if mom starts with sudden resp respiratory distress and shock, it's almost like throwing a PE. You know, they, they just can't breathe. They can't get enough air. Um, so we're going to need to manage ABC. She'll probably require intubation. Um, type and cross will be needed. She may need blood. Um, and you may see signs of DIC in this. So again, it's going to be supportive care until we get her to her destination. Uterine rupture. So you have a very pregnant lady involved in a possible trauma. And now you have a uterine, uterus that's normally very pliant and flexible, but for whatever reason, the trauma was enough to cause, you've got that blunt trauma that caused a burst. Um, you may, she may have, you know, had had previous surgeries to it, so there was a weaker spot of the uterus that just made it more susceptible to this. But what these women will experience, sharp, sudden onset of pain. Um, hypovolemic shock, because they may be bleeding internally. When you're feeling and doing that belly assessment, rebound tenderness, because now they're going to have bleeding into the per peritoneum and they're going to have peritoneal signs. Distension. The weirdest part about it is that when you're palpating, you can feel the baby. You don't feel the nice round uterus, you actually feel the baby parts. So you can feel the arm, you can feel the head, the feel the foot. And we shouldn't normally be able to feel them to that degree. But the uterus is no longer enveloping the baby with fluid inside of it. So the management, the only thing that's going to save mom at this point is surgery. 
So again, getting her to that nearest facility for surgical repair. Our immediate goal, preserve those ABCs. So if mom needs airway protection, we're gonna do it. And we want to provide as much utero placental perfusion. So left lateral recumbent, again, will be recommended 100% oxygen by non-rebreather. She'll need IV. And then if, you know, if we have the luxury of a Foley catheter, making sure that we ha are resuscitating with fluid appropriately to get the right urine output. Magnesium sulfate may be indicated as well to stop contractions to control hemorrhage and loss of fluid. Pregnancy hypertension. We may get a call for a, for a, a fairly pregnant woman who has a seizure. What condition does that happen in? Is it preeclampsia with a seizure or is it eclampsia? It's eclampsia. Once they have the seizure, they are fully eclamptic. So preeclampsia is when you have findings present. So what, what, what are the positive findings in preeclampsia? So blood pressure, pitting edema, protein, protein in the urine. So we've got a variety of vague, vague things. Mom might not feel or look all that well, generally. Um, but once they have the seizure, they are fully eclamptic. So they might need a magnesium sulfate inf infusion to manage those seizures. Um, morphine, they might develop pulmonary edema, so they might need drugs for that. And then antihypertensives for severe elevations would be part of the management. All right, let's look at our kiddos. A lot of you guys have the kiddo emergencies. Well, he's just not a happy little baby. So pulmonary, just kind of overview. I mean, you, you guys have had pals, right? So what's the number one cause of kids having, rest, uh, having a rust? It's pulmonary based, right? It's not, they're not the ones usually with the cardiac. You know, we have some cardiac conditions out here that we researched. But most normal kids do not have cardiac issues. So we're dealing with a lot of respiratory issues. So things that could be presenting, airway obstruction, which we'll hear about, foreign bodies, Edema, bronchospasm, trauma, infection, congenital heart defects. When the kid is having respiratory distress, our kids, have you seen kids in respiratory distress? They clip along with their compensatory mechanisms pretty darn well for a long period of time, right? Then once those compensatory mechanisms have failed, what happens? They just plummet. They are gone. All their reserves are absolutely gone. So our goal, of course, is basic and advanced life support to hopefully prevent complete failure. So we're all familiar with different kinds of respiratory th findings that we might have in our sick kids. Um, particularly looking at nasal flaring. You know, little ones don't have, they don't have as much musculature control in the nose, so you'll see a lot of nasal flaring to help get extra air in. You don't see that on adults. Uh, retractions, pretty, you can see some pretty significant retractions. Grunting, that's the, the infant's body's way of doing its own peep. So you might hear those grunting respirations. So you want to be real good to describe that if you can. Again, respiratory failure, baby's not responding as we would expect. They're flaccid, weak flaccid. Um, poor color, modeling. So one of them has increased pulmonary blood flow because of the heart defect. One of them has decreased blood flow. And then the third one has obstructive blood flow. So let's hear a little bit more about those. The first one increases pulmonary blood flow, and that's our PDA. So that's a very high-level overview. You guys did a great job.